Thank you, Brett. Um, so, it's uh, seven, you've had beer and coffee and whatever. But guess what? I hope that you're going to really wake up because I'm pretty animated regardless of how exhausting I am. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Yes, I'm Jamie Brown. I'm a, a group leader uh, at Kyoto University in the Graduate School of Medicine. And so I kind of want to um, discuss a couple of issues as we hear about AI a lot on TV and the news and it seems to have some kind of superhuman power. And they're talking about it like it's going to take our jobs and so on and so forth and people really get nervous about this. Thing. And what is AI in the first place? It turns out almost nobody, in fact sometimes the people who create it even know. But, uh, and then they say, you know, it can do anything. And then I hope today to kind of um, help dispel some of the myths so that we, uh, when we hear about it on TV, we understand what they're trying to talk about. At least the people who are reporting it, whether or not they understand it is a different story and um, how we can actually leverage this in medicine. So my focus is on making people's lives healthier um, and via these uh, AI type methods. So, um, just as a reminder, it might have been 10 years, it may have been 30 years or whatever, the basic flow of information in life in these in molecules, right? All the way at these little cells that sit on our skin and all the red blood cells that are flowing through our bodies while you're listening to me or while I'm talking to you, right? There's a stream of blood cells flowing. And of course, you know, someone like me who talks this fast is like, oh, you know, going everywhere. Anyway, in all of those cells is basically then um, some kind of structure like a cell here and then inside of every single one of those cells is the blueprint that makes us who we are. Now, that is at best the blueprint. It doesn't mean it's the building itself, right? That's a separate story. So the DNA is the blueprint of what we are. And then the environmental signals we choose turns it into something called the RNA. And Basically, that's your choice of whether you eat healthy or not, whether you sleep properly or not, whether you choose to uh, smoke, whether you choose to drink or whatever. All kinds of these things are your environment signals. And that makes up something in the sense. And then we have the DNA goes to what's called the RNA, and that becomes what's called the proteins. And those proteins can be all over the body and all over the cells and stuff. And those sort of have functions. So that's the blueprint of life. And so we can see, for example, like a bunch of skin cells here or other cells. You can see how they have like this kind of center place and then they have borders and they're talking they communicate to each other and you can see this uh, in the microscope and stuff like this and so every single um, one of these cells has a nucleus that is the center with their information about what it is that makes you you okay and all of those have exactly the same information in general so they are all the same blueprint but what they choose to do the way they evolve then is different and that becomes it, what's called expression in RNA, and that makes the actual products. That is the things um, that are expressed, and then that makes sort of why your skin cells look different than your hair cells, or than your eye cells, or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so um, we can actually see that these cells are, are really interesting because they have whole supports. Every cell is like a building. It's its own microcosm in a sense. It has, it has um, hallways, it has doors, it has all kinds of these neat things. And it's quite amazing that we're made up of trillions of these things, okay? So as I'm standing in front of you, there's trillions of cells all standing here, you know, with a pointer and blah, 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 <laughs> and they're all doing all this kind of signaling business at the same time. Anyway, that's what makes us alive, in a sense, actually almost anything that's living. And so inside of each one of these things is then like its own microcosm. Like I said, it's its own building, it's its own world, and each of these, uh, there's the, the nucleus and stuff like that, and inside then, in each of these cells, and that's where all the information is in the center, is all the information that makes it you and you from your grandparents, from your parents, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's at least the part you inherit and you can't control. Again, the part you can control is how you choose to live your life, with a positive mindset, a negative mindset, eating properly, sleeping properly, or sleeping terrible, like me. <laughs> I do medical research, which means I sleep almost never. Okay, not healthy, but that's what I have to do. So, um, anyway, those kinds of things are the signals to the environment. Okay? And then these kinds of things, like from the RNA to the protein, then they become things that look like this, this giant, you know, uh, looks like kind of a, a Pac-Man all deformed in a sense or something like that. And then these kind of things called proteins, they go all over the place and they represent cell signaling, like, like mental health signaling and all kinds of other types of features. <clears throat> And so <clears throat> part of the basic idea of what we do in medicine is that we try to discover drugs. And, and we do this sort of with like proteins. And so the basic idea is that we have these sort of targets in, in, that we want to find uh, drugs for. And so this is an example from the HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, right? Human immunodeficiency 
virus. There's four parts to the HIV. So HIV itself is not the condition of being sick. HIV is not that you're sick. It's just that there's a virus. Virus that induces in acquired immune deficiency syndrome. You are acquired in immune deficiency. That's what the condition of AIDS is. That's the problem. It's not the HIV virus. Although, of course, if the virus is in your cells, you have a problem, right? So, um, this is sort of HIV in some cells, and then what happens is we try to find out what are sort of those e proteins, those things in, in the molecules of life, and then once we figure out the main players, so to speak, in the game, then we try to build something that blocks the players, basically. That's the way the drugs are designed. So every time you go to buy something at the pharmacy, you've gone to buy something that's basically gone through this process. There's a problem. Who are the players involved in the problem? How do we stop the players? That's basically what's going on. Not always, not 100%, but quite often. And so, for example, this is a cancer um, uh, treatment called um, gefitinib, for example, and here is a particular protein that sits on all of your cells and takes this oops, signal um, that looks for uh, something from the outside in your bloodstream so that way cells can re replicate, like in cancer. What is cancer? Cells just keep on growing. They never stop like they're supposed to. Anyway, and this thing kind of helps block that signal. Okay? And so this is an example of an anti-cancer uh, chemical chemotherapy, for example, and it's used even today in many, many hospitals around the world. And um, another one, uh, for example, these things called proteins in life. This is called the P53. This is really crucial because this is like the gatekeeper uh, that protects against cancer. And once um, some one of these things, it's the same. It's the same guy. Imagine it's like four copies of yourself, and all four copies come together to help protect your DNA. And when one of these things gets knocked off the train tracks, so to speak, they have some mutation, then the whole thing starts to go wrong. And then um, it's very common that the mechanism to protect your cells goes off. And then that's when cells are replicating so fast and you get very, uh, people get very ill very fast. Uh, and so this is one of the key mechanisms by which cancer um, starts. Anyway, so, so, okay. So we see that there are proteins, and that sometimes proteins talk to proteins. You see, this is the same guy talking to itself in four different places, for example, four copies. And then again, they have these things called small molecules. So um, this is about mental health, and you might say, well, how does mental health connect to any of this? Well, of course, again, it's about the signaling, because this is all; these are all signals, basically, that's happening in our body. Now, what is a small molecule? So I hate to painfully, painfully bring back some of you to your high school chemistry days. <laughs> But let's have a quick review here about some basic organic chemistry. So this is the most simple molecule we can possibly think of. It's called methane. It has one carbon atom and four hydrogens that attach to it. Probably learned this long, long ago. Okay. If we had two carbons put together, this would be called ethane, because a carbon bonds to a carbon, and then a bunch of hydrogens attached to that. Now, there are some alter, uh, alternative versions of that. There's, for example, if there's an oxygen atom and a hydrogen, this is called methanol. Where's methanol? For example, in the Sea of Japan. They're trying to dig it out right now as an energy source, for example. Uh, liquid methane and all these other kinds of things, right? And methanol provides energy because you burn it and then it turns into energy, for example. Now, the next guy there is this guy called ethanol. So see, ethane became ethanol. Ethanol is our good friend in the drinks. Congratulations. If you're enjoying your drink, you're enjoying the ethanol. And hopefully then there's an enzyme in your liver that takes care of it. Uh, otherwise, you'll be on the floor in a few minutes. <laughs> So, thank you, ethanol, for making my nerd night much better. Anyway, uh, propane, right? Everybody knows propane in your gas tank if you're going to have a barbecue, probably. Yep. Or now, if you're in Japan, then you're special because you have these little bit of tiny tanks that sit on your desk top, and you can basically have a, an onabe or something like that. Right? Another version would be, um, if, again, if you add the alcohol, isopropanol. Anybody have any idea what isopropanol might be good for? Ladies, how many of you uh, polish your nails? Mm. And how many of you have to take off the nail polish? I, this is basically what's in your nail polish. That's the only thing. It is. So it's one piece of an alcohol connected to three carbons, basically. And that's why you can buy it now in Japan, let the 100 yen shop, because it's pretty much um, mass producible. And uh, that's, that's basically what's in it. And then all the different companies that, you know, all the expensive cosmetics at the, at the department store, they just add something to make it smell good. And you're like, oh, I feel good. You know, because they add something. But actually, all it is is this. The 100 yen shop does the job pretty much all the time, at least medically. And then there's another one. If you have eight of these carbons all joined together, that's called octane. Anybody know what octane is? Sure. It was, it was, it was in your car. And then that's how they score how good your gasoline is when you buy gasoline, right? The more of this there is, the higher the octane rating from them. These are all small molecules. Small molecules of life. You wouldn't want to drink something like that. Obviously, you'd get quite sick. 
But the other ones, yeah, we do pretty good with ethanol. Fortunately, there's something in our liver that takes care of that. Now, there are a couple of them I want to mention real quick. Like, say, hexane. There's six of these things, hex. So there's six of these guys, and they can even join together in like a circle. This would be called cyclohexane, for example. It's quite amazing. Life can take all kinds of forms. You can join them together. We represent like this, or for example, benzene. If any of you are from Europe, you know that benzene has been the fuel for diesel vehicles for quite a long time. And in fact, the German government is about to ban all cars that use benzene uh, on roads in about five years or so. But this is basically what has kept Europe uh, cheap for shipping using uh, trucks, because this is the main piece of fuel, for example. Um, another one you can do, it looks like a barbell, it's two of these benzene things put together, right? And so this is very basic things about chemistry and how atoms can come together. Now, what happens then is, now we build on top of that. And now we have small molecules that humans have built, for example. And, and so this is things like ibuprofen or aspirin. Yeah, they, uh, you're going to need one of those after this talk, I'm sure. <laughs> um, or if you're uh, from Japan, then you know Daiichi Sankyo, the big Japanese pharma company. They have something like Doksan, for example. Now, as you see, I keep talking, I keep moving, I keep shaking. Maybe I should take something to just calm myself down. Well, then that would be something like diazepam. This is the most common one that for people who have tremors, they shake, or they can't keep calm. This is something to help people keep calm, for example. So this is, again, applications of the, different, of the different chemistries I've shown you. And then, for example, if it gets more complicated, like the HIV uh, medicine, the first one that was ever approved in 1996, this is called Sikinavir. And this was the first one that was um, developed uh, to help HIV patients uh, after um, French and American teams managed to identify uh, one of the key players in the uh, HIV AIDS uh, pathology. And it looked like that. Now, uh, there's also other things, all the same chemistry, like say vitamins, your A, D, and K. They say, oh, take your vitamins, take your vitamins. And when your baby is born, like my kids were, give them a vitamin K shot right away. Right? And that would be the thing right over here, for example. And you can see they kind of start to make these interesting structures. They have their own, it's this whole world. They have all these different kinds of patterns and phenomenons about them. And here are a couple of other key ones, the steroids. And I don't mean the ones where the guy, you know, takes and injects them in his arm so he can hit a baseball a little bit further. I'm talking about the ones that we really actually need in, in life. And uh, for example, estrogen. Yeah, everybody hopefully knows that one, the female hormone, and say androgen or testosterone. Yeah, that's the one, guys, that makes you go, hey, I see her, I like that. Yeah. Right? There's your signaling. <laughs> that basically, that's what's telling you to say, hey, I kind of like that. Um, there's your testosterone, for example. Now, uh, and another example then also would be, for example, um, pain reliever like silicoxin. So this is again another pain reliever like aspirin, and you ask, well, who is its target basically? And the target is that it's something called the cyclooxygenase COX-2, and so they manage to build this molecule, and then it goes and it hits in this little pocket, it goes boop, like a key in a keyhole, and then it, that stops the pain. It's quite amazing. In about 100 years, we've come to learn that it's something you, can, you can't even see with the human eye or with a microscope, but that's how it works. So uh, we're making progress in that, so, so to speak. Now, the question then is, if that, for example, if you have a compound and that's its target, so to speak, how many drug targets are there? Well, actually, we didn't know. And for the first 150 years of human um, pharmacology, we just thought there was a couple hundred, and because that's what we were able to develop molecules for, and make people have less pain with ethers or whatever like that. Well, it turned out in 2001 then, we finally finished the first draft of the human genome, so to speak. That is, what does it mean to be human in the first place at a DNA level? All the ACGTs we learned in biology, all of that. In look at one day apart. These are the two most famous scientific journals, probably not most famous, but quite well known, so to speak. And they published one day apart. What does it mean for us to be human beings, so to speak? And uh, they found out there's about 20,000 genes that code for proteins. So while we had like 100 or so figured out by 2001, turns out there's about 20,000. <laughs> so how much do we know about ourselves? Not that much, in, in some sense. And in 2018, there was a review out of um, a very prominent uh, group, and they showed in this particular figure that the amount that we actually have compounds in the clinic to make you feel better, whether it be mental health or cancer or whatever, yeah, is about 3%. <laughs> so we managed to figure out, yeah, 3% of 20,000 possible ways to kind of manipulate ourselves, in a sense, right? And um, now, let's talk about one of them, about mental health, that we really do understand. And um, I'm very happy that um, the talk before me, uh, Mira had a, a nice discussion about serotonin receptor, the well-being one, or the willpower one, right? So what happens then? Well, this is serotonin itself, and this is what's in your brain, and so for mental health. And so this thing, when it's running around in your brain, it jumps into this little opening gate here on the outside of your cells and says, hey, I feel 
willpower as you say i'm gonna do it yeah i can do it right and this is one of the molecules that's kind of involved in your yeah i can do it kind of attitude so and that's that's the way it basically works again just like before with the drug discovery for say pain or something what we can do is we can find some things that kind of jump into this pocket now what's the next kind of molecule that can jump into the very same pocket it's called lysergic acid um, diethylamine also known as LSD. You might wonder, when I was getting ready for this talk, was I on LSD? Uh, no, actually I was not, uh, never have. Um, but LST, LSD, you know, it makes people have these quote trips, acid trips or whatever. And basically what's happening is, when you take LSD, then basically it jumps into this little pocket here at the top and, and creates a bunch of signals in the brain and says, whoa, I see colors and I see all kinds of stuff like that. So that's why people have these trips on LSD and think it's great. The problem is they don't know when to stop, right? So, um, but this is the basic idea about what LSD does. And you say, oh, well, it, it hits the serotonin receptor, for example. Um, and so that's basically like a look down from the very top. So on the left is the general structure, and from the right side is basically from the top we can figure out what happened. Now that's how do we, now that we know this is the basic idea of how we stay mentally um, fit, so to speak, there's some proteins and small molecules. Now, how do we actually do something like this for people's health? And so this is an example of an antipsychotic, in other words, for people who are depressed, called risperidone. And if you can notice, it takes the exact same principle. There's a hole in here to find, to stick a key, basically. And if you can manage to develop the right key, you can make people feel mentally better. So this is a, a commonly used in the clinic. And it was not until last year, in fact, that this was the actual structure and how it was actually hitting in the keyhole. And this was resolved here at Kilt University uh, just last year in a very prominent uh, nature level journal. So we knew that much. Now the other part, like I said with the LSD, is how much is enough? That's why people die on overdoses of drugs, right? So basically, every, whenever we do pharmacology, we always have to ask, how much is okay? <laughs> and um, so uh, basically this graph shows like as you increase how intense, how much of a dose it is, then how much of an effect do you get? And we always have to try to find like the happy middle point basically. Um, now, what else uh, in, in the same framework then affects our mental happiness, our state of alertness? And so there are the, the feeling hormones, so to speak, the catecholamines as we like to call them. So amine basically means there's one nitrogen atom in them. And it starts out with phenylalanine basically. Where do you get phenylalanine? Soybeans, pork, beef, these kinds of things. It's in there. So as your body then dissolves it, and uh, as you, it goes to your stomach, your stomach secretes the enzymes to break it down, then this is what starts with. And then it gets processed, and a couple of steps later, it gets into something called dopamine. Ah, there we are again, the happiness, right? Dopamine, right? That's probably, uh, right, the feeling you get when you go to the club or something, you see somebody like, hey, maybe that person like to talk to me, then you start to get feeling happy. Right? That's the happy part that we had earlier. And dopamine then can get processed and turns into adrenaline. And that's the part where not only have you uh, made it to the club and met somebody nice, you might have a chance for a social interaction with them. And so then your adrenaline receptors are going, whoa, I feel pretty happy, right? And that is our mental happiness, so to speak. Now, um, then we heard also earlier, and I wanted to mention it then, is something like, say, cortisol, right? And amazingly, if you look at the structure of this thing, cortisol, it looks exactly like estrogen and testosterone, more or less. It's also, in fact, a steroid hormone. And so um, this is what makes us feel better. Now, um, cortisol in, in history, and we, again, we're very nice to have an introduction to evolution that we had to worry about how to find food. We had to worry about surviving, right? And this was a serious problem. So what would happen is cortisol was the molecule that kind of helped us keep our blood sugar up if we didn't have anything to eat, for example. That's one function of it. Um, and it had a state of alertness, and it can improve our memory but too much of it, and suddenly your immune system doesn't work so well. You get sick or easy, for example. Um, the other thing is your blood pressure will go up. So the more that cortisol goes out, the higher your blood pressure is, and where does it come from? In your adrenal glands, so basically um, right above your kidneys, basically. And so that's the basic sort of um, strategy. Now, as it appears to me, um, yeah, uh, we'll be short on time, but basically, um, what you can do then to control cortisol and keep yourself at a good blood pressure, at a good mental state, um, is things like yoga, things like meditation, things like positive thoughts, 
talk to yourself. So that was a fantastic talk because one thing I will I used to do in days gone by, I listened to the, uh, the motivational speeches of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And you know what he said? Ignore the naysayers. And you know what? That was so true in my career. I have countless companies calling me now for developing drugs with AI. And I'm going to run out of the time on the AI part. But it's very true, in fact. If you can stay positive, and things will go wrong. I've been beaten over the coals plenty of times. But if you keep pushing yourself and turning the, the positives, and you say, I can do it, and I will have learned from my mistakes, then yes, you will learn how to keep control of your cortisol levels, for example, and things will um, mentally uh, go quite well. So um, let me kind of get to the last little bit of AI, and then I have to jump on. So again, we have these receptors, and somehow they're involved um, with us to make drugs. And um, again, the basic idea was that we wanted to find, for some receptors, some kind of molecules to do this. And now there are these machines like the, this guy on the right side here, that if you take this sort of basic um, structure and then you say, well, I want to add this or add this or add this, or this, these machines can do all of this, thousands of molecules. We test them all, basically. And then we can put all of them into these kind of newer robots. Of course, these cost like a million dollars, and they're not exactly in our local uh, supermarket or our local uh, electronic shop. But um, these things can work 24 hours a day. Try every combination if you want. You might say, well, then, hey, we can solve every mental problem because we can basically have these machines do everything 24 hours a day. Problem is, you're looking for needles in haystacks. So basically, if you try to use those robots and you spend 10 million US dollars to make bunches of compounds, you might get about 1% of them that show effectiveness of, of, of any even remote type. So 99% of what you just spent all your money on Resulted in nothing. <laughs> okay. So basically, what's happening in recent years is they have something called virtual screening. That is, we want to use the computer to figure out how uh, to find, like a magnet, basically, how to, to pull as a tool to pull up the right compounds the fastest and create cures uh, for uh, psychological conditions. Um, I kind of will skip that, but basically, what um, I kind of want to get to the end of here is that um, these days, they were pretty much telling us that like AI is going to take over our jobs, it's going to be human-like or whatever, and um, I don't really have time to talk about the reason because I'm already over time, but basically, um, that's not going to happen, okay? Uh, that's all I, I really want to make my point is that um, in the end, um, you have a lot of psychological willpower over your mental state, you have actually complete power if you wish to believe it. Whoops, well, that apparently jumped. Um, and then um, the machines will only be as good as we as people make them. So they're talking about self-driving cars and it's all about deep learning ever, but actually deep learning, I'll give you an insider uh, comment, is just deep copying. There is nothing proven yet that deep learning can do something that a human being cannot. Okay? AI basically does exactly what we need it to repeat repetition, as we just as we heard, and basically has to automate that process. And I'll skip all of the philosophy of statistics and how it's going to work. Of course, if you want to know about that, I'd be happy to talk about it, oh, in great detail. <laughs> um, but um, uh, this is how we're trying to um, develop molecules, and, and as one of the um, targets of, of molecule development, um, using AI or these computational methods to accelerate the process to then help people feel better um, with, say, less dependence on these and so on and so forth. So um, I hope this is kind of an interesting thing about how um, happiness, uh, depression, mental health works on a, on a uh, biophysical level, all the way at the level of your individual cells. And um, please don't worry, AI is not going to steal your job. So, okay, thank you very much. All right, to go to the most topical health issue right now, the coronavirus. Mm. Okay. Is, is AI in use in any way, shape, or form in, as far Absolutely. as that? Oh, so the question is, is AI helping us fight the coronavirus at all? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, the only thing that's helping us take care of the coronavirus is the basic biophysical methods and technologies that have built, been built by solid engineering practices up to now. And so that means um, we have now isolated, much like the HIV, um, let me go back here then um, for you. So where are you? 
Yeah. So much like the HIV, we've been able to isolate at least the cells from people that are showing the coronavirus. And then we've been able to start looking at um, the DNA sequence of uh, the virus itself. And that at least gives us a preliminary guess as to um, how uh, its proteins will, will fold into real 3D shapes. And that's why here in Japan, they're considering using HIV drugs at the moment for coronavirus because they assume that there's some similarity. And hopefully then, if the, if the spatial shape of the keyholes is similar in coronavirus, then the HIV drugs would also jump into those little holes and knock down the virus from replicating. That's the current strategy. But AI actually has no ability to do that. It's just simply the idea of looking for things that are similar. And in fact, that's all that AI is, is looking to say, oh, I've seen something like that before. I guess it's the same thing the next time. Um, yeah, and so that's the, the point that actually it's of no real amazing jumping quantum leap benefit at the moment.